I think that the new government has made clear its intention to be proactive about human rights. Uh, we can only hope that the government stands by its stated commitment, particularly to do with uh, uh, progress in the areas of child rights and other areas uh, such as uh, the matters of inequity and inequality that, that have been flagged, which are very important human rights issues. Uh, now, while the government may have said that those are its priorities, it remains to be seen whether it will actually act on those priorities. It is our hope that the government does. Um, I certainly believe that, that uh, these issues that have been raised by the Prime Minister Imran Khan in his inaugural speech, subsequently by the Human Rights Minister, are really very important issues. Uh, one is very heartened to hear the government's overt and stated commitment uh, to, to tackling human rights issues and abuses and even issues that uh, so far we thought were um, off limits for one reason or another. The human rights minister has been uh, uh, to a rally uh, by uh, the families of the disappeared uh, she has said that she takes the business of enforced disappearances seriously. The government has also indicated that it may uh, consider drafting a law um, to, to, to address the issue of enforced disappearances. These are all immensely positive steps. And I think that we should, uh, at the outset, take the government at its word. We should uh, have uh, faith in the government and we should wait for it to fulfill or fail to fulfill its stated commitments before we can critique the government on this matter. I think that that, that critique lies sometime in the future. It may be a bit premature yet. It is quite clear that uh, human rights violations and abuses stem from very many systemic uh, problems in countries such as ours. But uh, the underlying cause, which is seldom talked about, but is absolutely critical, perhaps it is unpopular to talk about it, is the issue of inequity, of rising inequity, of lack of opportunity, um, of attendant economic and social and cultural rights that are denied because of lack of, of, of equity in society. So I think that those issues are really what the government's focus ought to be on. Um, Pakistan is, um, it may have its problems, but it is a parliamentary democracy into its third elected government from a civilian transfer of power. Uh, so in that sense, I think our focus has to shift from hardcore civil and, polit uh, civil and political rights to the more pressing uh, question of access to education, access to sanitation, access to health. These are all human rights. Um, they are not talked about often enough in our country. And the government has certainly, in its initial um, uh, statements on the matter, raised, flagged the issue, for example, of children's rights. Fine. That's an excellent step and certainly child rights which are tied in to, again, to issues of inequity, lack of access to education and health and sanitation need to be addressed. I think these issues need to be addressed more broadly. Um, this is important not just from a rights perspective but also from the perspective of building and strengthening democracy, pluralism, pluralism and constitutional rule in our country because unless your democratic order delivers basic necessities and basic needs to its people, its legitimacy will inevitably be compromised. If its legitimacy is compromised, the greater edifice of civil and political rights that we uh, consider so important, because it is important, such as constitutional rule, genuine periodic elections, all of that will also uh, stand uh, endangered if we do not show that our democracy delivers and it delivers the basic needs of life which are the principal human rights that any individual enjoys to them. Uh, countering extremism has been one of the principal challenges that our country has faced uh, since 2001 certainly. Some would argue since much earlier. Um, 
the fact is that this is now no longer a question of a choice. Uh, any government in Pakistan, regardless of its political persuasion, uh, as long as it is an elected government, it has to engage uh, in the issue of countering violent extremism. Uh, this is a problem that creates insecurity across the state. Uh, you know, the, the most basic of human rights is the right to life. And uh, the right to life has been re repeatedly compromised um, with tremendous human cost in our country. So um, the government has expressed its intention to, to address this issue and I have every reason to believe that they will address this issue. Now the question is how effectively will they address this issue? Again, that remains to be seen. Right now we have to take the government at face value, we have to act in good faith. Um, there are certain things, of course, that are absolutely clear that need to be done. Some of them are relatively easily done because they are a matter of emphasis and what you say and you don't say. Um, and then there are other matters that uh, will aid countering violent extremism uh, through more tangible means. There can be legislative attempts. There can be, um, uh, you know, administrative uh, 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 attempts that are, that are, that are undertaken to do the same. Um, it is a little, if you will, uh, dispiriting that, that, that um, the government in its early steps has faltered in, in, in its commitment to, to combat violent extremism. Um, we have had instances, you know, combating violent extremism is also about, about um, sending the right message. The right message is absolutely critical. We recently had a fiasco with our Economic Advisory Council where a member of a minority who was, well, one of the great experts in the world on, in economics was denied membership of that council on the basis of his faith. Um, that is the kind of action that sends the wrong message. I would hope that learning from that early error uh, the government will ensure that when it decides to send a message uh, that 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 indicates or or that that um, illustrates that Pakistan is a non-sectarian uh, pluralistic society, it will have the political will to then stand by that decision, even in the face of blowback. Uh, that, as of now we uh, cannot say for certain is the case. What we have is statements of political intent. Whether they translate into political will and action remains to be seen. I certainly hope that they do. Well, look, there are lots of non-kinetic uh, initiatives that can be taken on CVE. This is, again, as I said, it is about um, how we present ourselves. There is, there is at the level of, of the popular media, at the level of your regulatory authorities, it is, for example, for PEMRA to ensure that uh, those who propagate hate speech uh, for the, uh, uh, do not get airspace, do not get airtime. Um, it, is, it, is, it is, in fact, the government's job to ensure that that is the case because hate speech, as we know, is, incites violence and that is the problem with it. So, uh, you know, a concerted attempt by the state. The other thing, of course, is that, you know, countering violent extremism or uh, um, propagating human rights, for that matter, are, uh, is a holistic approach. It has to be a holistic approach. So this is not the job of PEMRA or the Dawn, the newspaper, for example, or the Ministry of Information. Uh, countering violent extremism has to be mainstreamed through all government departments, all line departments, uh, all governance mechanisms. And when you do that, you will begin to see results. It is not about what is necessarily legal or illegal. It is about what is, as a society, morally and ethically acceptable and unacceptable to us. I'm sorry and I'm saddened that that line has, has, has uh, traveled too far down of what is acceptable and, and all manner of hate speech and all manner of 
activity, um, political and otherwise, that encourages violent extremism has been allowed to run riot. It is now time for the government to take a multi-sectoral uh, 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 approach and that multi-sectoral approach should, should encourage all arms of the state to actually view their mandates, to look at their mandates and to see where they can actually bring in uh, attempts, initiatives, modules, trainings, you name it, the whole range of tools available to you to counter violent extremism. This is as true of the health ministry as it is true of uh, the Department of Social Welfare, as it is true of the Ministry of Information. So this is really about, you know, the, the violent extremism can take many, many forms. And say, if a transgender person goes to a hospital and they are beaten, that is violent extremism. There is somebody engaging in an act of bigotry and prejudice. So I think that we need to broaden, broaden our definition of what constitutes violent extremism. And we need to broaden our approach in terms of how we will be countering it.